Welcome to the pro-black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Your host tonight is the author of the pro-black compendium and Zuberi and the Maroons of Ma'a, the pan-African nationalist Oni. Oni, what are we discussing tonight? Peace, family. So you're tuning into the pro-black perspective on KWAZ Radio. Be sure to check out the other programs on KWAZ Radio. And also, if you're interested in having your own program on the network, you know, let us know. Today, we're really going to discuss African culture. And I'm going to be a little bit provocative and say, look, you know, this, this, this broad African culture doesn't exist. And most of our people are just playing dress up. Okay? Most of you are just playing dress up. Well, it's going to be a juicy one tonight. All right? It's going to be a juicy one tonight. <laughs> Today, depends on what time zone you're in. Uh, so, before we get into that, I want you to, like I said, I really encourage you to check out the other programs on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro-Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. All right, fam. So the first thing we're going to do is this African culture that Jolt described, right? We're going to investigate this, all right? So first things first, let's look it over. Jolt has this two cradle theory. This is derived by some, somebody creates this, right? They break it down. Uh, it's here at Jalumi's uh, website, right? Uh, the two cradle theory, I put this up on the African Blood Siblings website. I put this up back in 2011, okay? So that was 10 years ago. This was in November 17th, but still 10 years ago, right? It says Job's two cradle theory from the African origin of civilization and cultural unity. If you didn't read those books, you could go out and read them, right? He says these are the characteristics of these two cradles developed by environment after a separation during the Ice Age, okay? So the southern cradle, the Egyptian model, there's an abundance of vital resources, sedentary. It's, it's sedentary and agricultural. It's gentle, idealistic, peaceful with nature, with a spirit of justice. You know, it has matriarchal families, it's emancipation of women in domestic life. It's a territorial state. You know, they have territorial states. They're xenophilia. You know, they love other individuals. They're cosmopolitan, right? They, have, they, 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 believe, they believe in social collectivism. There's this material solidarity of right for individuals which makes moral or material misery unknown, right? We have ideas of peace, justice, goodness, and optimism. You know, and our literature emphasizes novel tales, fables, and comedy. This is the quote-unquote African culture we all kind of aspire to. We all kind of generalize. We all speak about, oh, yes, you know, you can't, sure, we're, we're matriarchal by, by nature. You know, we have an abundance of resources. We're agricultural people. That's what, we, that's what we're told to believe in. And, you know, just to complete it, we have the northern cradle, you know, the Greek model. They have a bareness of resources. They're nomadic hunters. They're pirates, you know? They're ferocious, warlike nature with a spirit of survival. Patriarchal families. Debasement and enslavement of women. They have city-states. They're forts. You know, all their states are, you know, unlike us, you know, we have uh, territories. They have city-states, forts, you know, military outposts. They're all about xenophobia. Who are you? I don't know you. Parochialism individualism you know we have social you know social collectivism they have individualism moral solitude disgust for existence pessimism and their literature is about tragedy 
right? Tragedy, tragedy, tragedy. Okay. That's what we were told to believe. And this is not the picture. This is not the complete picture. And I'm going to demonstrate how not. But I want to continue with this theme of, well, what were we told and what's reality, right? So I think it might have been last week I went over Martin Delaney's book, right? I'm well, sorry, I went over the book of power. I was in the book of power and we touched on Martin Delaney's uh, reading. So I want to go right back to that. So I'm going to open up uh, the book of power right now and let's just see if I can share the screen with you. Okay, so in the book of power, you have Martin Delaney's speech on page 308, okay? No, actually, page 307. We're on Martin Delaney's speech, page 307, and it's, you know, how white liberals conned Africans for over a century. You know, somewhere in this reading, and if you if you paid attention last week or, or two weeks ago, you might have picked up on me kind of, what? Okay, right? But here's page 309, right? Martin Delaney goes, but the African race had long been known to Europeans in all ages of the world's history as a long-lived hardy race subject to toil and labor of various kinds, subsisting mainly by traffic, trade, and industry, and consequently being as foreign to the sympathies of the invaders of the continent as the Amerindians. indians They were selected, captured, brought here as a laboring class, and as a matter of policy held as such. Nor was the absurd idea of natural inferiority of the African ever dreamed of until recently induced by the slaveholder and their betters in justification of this policy. Right? Uh, yeah, he said, this contemptuous indignation we fling back into their face as a scorpion to a vulture, and so did our patriots and leaders in the cause of regeneration, better known. Um, the point being, you know, here's what we're also told about African culture. We are, we deal mainly in traffic. We subsist mainly on traffic, trade, and industry. You know what I'm saying? We, we're we're, we're world-class laborers, you know? Uh, hardy, long lived. That's that's our reputation around the world. That's what we're told. We're like, hey, you know, if you want to be an African, you know, this is what we are. This is how we are. Okay, so far so good. You're like, hey, those are some good things. Those are those are some positive things. Let's see. We're going to jump to Urugu. If you guys remember, I also read Urugu for you, right? And the reason why I'm going through all these is just to say, look, it's not about Jope. It's not about Delaney. It's not about anybody in particular. It is, although this next example is also a joke, but it is really us believing in this African culture and then making these generalizations and then what that also means for us as a people if we're really trying to understand what we need to do to move forward. Okay, so bear with me. This is uh, Marimba Ani's Urugu. This is page 304 of Urugu. I'm going to start off with Marimba Ani's reading and then jump into Jope because uh, she, she links Jope. So he says, what characteristics do Africans and others display? And what would these characteristics indicate about our ethical systems, our worldview? So again, we Africans have an ethical system and a worldview. We people of other cultures are all too often make the mistake of attempting to treat this European who comes to take our land and who looks so different from us as a brother or sister. Africans and other non-European people invariably seek to include him in our system of gifts exchange. So we have a system of gifts exchange, offering him love and peace. In other words, the purely rhetorical precepts of behavior propagandized as a Christian virtue. Now, again, I don't even I don't even know why we engage with this Christian nonsense, but, you know, it is what it is. Right. I mean, you know, she had a reason. She was remember Ani was talking about she was doing an anthropological study of Europeans. So it's in that context, it makes a lot of sense. But I think for us, like for me, I, I, like, I want to vomit every time I say it. But, you know, it is what it is. Are actually the models of behavior natural to other cultures and older traditions than that of the Europeans. So, so look again. This Christian virtue. I hate saying this, but. All right. <laughs> this Christian virtue are the models of behavior natural to other cultures and older traditions than that of Europeans. So basically... Uh, according to this, African people are naturally Christian. That's what we're told, okay? Um, and, you know, to me, it's like, ugh. But, you know, I'm reading this so that you can, you know, we're building up to something, all right? Bear with me. 
And Europeans naturally display behavior patterns that are in direct contradiction to what they have labeled as Christian virtues, i.e. virtues that are actually African, non-European values and standards of behavior, which their culture does not generate, support, motivate, nor sanction. People of other cultures often must be taught to mistrust their enemy, those who would destroy them. Europeans instinctively hate, or rather do not love those outside their culture who are a priori enemies, right? So... And I, I was looking at this because I reason why I even brought this up because I was like, you know, but I was also saying, where is this idea coming from? Right. So, again, check on the job shows up. Right. And it's like what I find remarkable is that an in individual attitude of blacks towards other races is a difference of approach. So this is another way of saying the. Uh, uh, Two cradle theory, right? What I find remarkable is that in the individual attitude of blacks towards other races, there's a difference of approach. Blacks are not racist. Blacks are not afraid of ethnic conflicts. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Blacks are not afraid of ethnic context. Whites are. I think that much of racism stems from that fear. It is an inherited. Now, is it an inherited trait of the nomadic life of the primitive Aryan? I don't know. Is it a biological or other type of instinct? I don't know that either. What is quite evident, however, is that xenophobia is definitely an entrenched trait of European cultures from way back. I think even European scholars would agree with me on this. In fact, as it turns out, one of the weaknesses of black civilization, again, one of the weaknesses of black civilization, particularly during medieval times, was the openness, the cosmopolitanism of their societies. The medieval black kingdoms were open to peoples of all horizons. And today, one of the basic weaknesses of African societies is that they still maintain this inherited cosmopolitan trait. Nationalism in Africa emerge as a purely defensive reflex. Narrow nationalism, xenophobia, exclusion of foreigners has never been a policy of African cultures. We always find it associated with Indo-European culture. So again, you know, he's saying, look, this narrow nationalism, this xenophobia, these are not things that are in African cultures. You know, African people are cosmopolitan, period, point blank, done. Right? That's what we're told to believe. That's what we're told to believe. Now, now um, I just want to give you one more passage before I give you the counter argument, uh, right? Uh, this is going to be on page, uh, hold on a second, let me just pick up the book. So I'm going to put in, this is page 346. Okay, so we go to Vernon Dixon. It's just give me a sentence. Vernon Dixon tells us that the African objective is the use of forces in nature to restore a more harmonious relationship between man and the universe. Human beings in the phenomenal world are interdependent. The phenomenal world becomes personalized, right? In Dixon's comparison of the African and European worldviews, he discusses the respective concepts of self that emerge from the two philosophies, right? Then he goes on about the European view and so on and so forth. But you, you notice there's this idea. Africans have this objective, this, 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 this harmonious relationship with nature, right? We exist, you know, our, we have a spirituality, an inherent spirituality that's harmonious with nature and harmonious with the universe. And we're, you know, these great scientists, great philosophers, great, you know, just great individuals. And look, it sounds good. Makes you feel good, you know? Wow, that's who I am. Those are my people. We're, we're, we're just these brilliant, uh, you know, scholars. And, and, and bear in mind, we also season our food well. You know, we, we do all sorts of amazing things, you know? We built pyramids. We, 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 we season food. We, we, uh, we, we created mathematics where we're, we're, we're brilliant individuals. Now, great. Got through the exposition, okay? Now it's time for the counter evidence, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over to YouTube, okay? We're going to go to YouTube, and we're going to play you two videos, all right? So this first video is about the Hadzabe tribe, okay? The Hadzabe people. The Hadzabe people, I'm going to try to play this whole video. Um, is this thing centered well? No, it's not. Okay. I'm going to try to play this whole video, all right? This is a white boy. It goes to... Uh, I'm going to have to interrupt it, too, because, you know, you have to uh, add some sort of content to it, right? But this white boy goes into uh, Tanzania, and he finds a people there. The people are the Hadzabe people. They are hunter-gatherers, 
Okay, so remember, the, the thing is, African people have a culture that's uh, agricultural, right? These are not agriculturalists, first and foremost, but they're African. You know, they are African, but they are not agriculturalists, right? And and you have to pay attention to everything you were told by Jope and them uh, about African culture, and then see what you can see in these people. And bear in mind, I want to give this for an exposition too. That it might be a lot. Of, it might be that the questions are lost in translation, but they still have the gravity that they have. The Hedzabe are a small tribe of hunter-gatherers living by Lake Eyasi in Tanzania. They are some of the last true hunter-gatherers left on planet Earth and are under threat of disappearing. There are only about 1,500 left. About two months ago, I was fortunate to be able to spend 48 hours hunting with them. Oh. This is exciting. Oh, yeah. Go, 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 go. Ah. 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 It was all the excitement you'd expect. Later, I returned to join them, this time in a longer 72-hour hunting trek, deeper in the African bush. During this time, and right before raiding another baboon camp, I asked Sokolo, the leader of this tribe of hunter-gatherers, What's the most important thing in life? Manako. Yeah, Manako. Yeah, Manako. Okay, so just to, just to clarify. <laughs> so he's asked what's the most important thing in life. Now here's where it, it might be a mistake of translation, right? Might be what's the most important thing to live. Who knows what he understood, right? But notwithstanding that, meat is the answer. Okay? Meat. Manako bala. bala. Oh, and also just picture this too. You have to look at what these people look like because they look like you and me. You understand? We look the same. This guy walking around with a with you know different clothes would appear like you or me. It's a it's a baboons? Yeah, he saw baboons. Baboons over there. They go to sleep over there. So, quick question as a bear, not a bit of a pack cobble. If I know, so that's good. I ask, okay. So now again, now now I wish I didn't interrupt earlier. I'll try to interrupt whenever the white boy is about to ask another question. But now remember, you're the people who inherently respect nature, right? You're the people who are inherently agriculturalists. You're the people who are inherently sedentary, right? Yet this is realistically speaking. Now, this person is our contemporary, right? But the lifestyle that he's living, okay, is uh, parallel to the one that our ancestors, distant, distant ancestors have done. Okay, distant, distant, right? Or maybe even, for some of us, not even that distant. You know? Because this is, I don't even want to use the key word here, right? But... I want you to just bear in mind that this is an example of, 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 of an African culture in reality that doesn't fit the, the mode that we were talking about. There's a reason why. But remember what he was asked. He said, what's the most important thing in life? And he said, uh, meat, honey, corn porridge, right? Different types of foods. But, you know, meat is very important. What happens after you die? The youngest hunter, Babua, joins us. He and I want to say this. This kid looks like, like he's, 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 he's a beautiful boy, you know? Um, you know, he's, he looks like a child you would see anywhere around here. But born into this community he's of the like it's like 
again, I'm going to go over what culture is, but you can see how it shapes people. All right. He wants to help clarify some of Sokolo's answers, starting with the importance of hydration. I ask, what was your happiest day? Now with Babua here, I ask again, what happens when you die? uh, do they believe that they see their ancestors when they die after? Yeah, I asked Sokolo. Okay, so look now. Now this what that was a really interesting scene about spirituality. Um, what happens when you die? Oh, we put you in a hole. Now again, that could be a mistranslation where it's like, what do you do after people die? Oh yeah, we put them in a hole, right? Uh, notwithstanding that, you know, you did hear. Well, I don't know if you heard, you read uh, how, well, of course, you also, I want to say this, you did notice the Western imposition of language, right? Where he says that we pray and all's well, they say, oh, we don't know if they go to heaven or something. Obviously, they didn't use the word heaven, uh, the concept of heaven, like, like as, as, and the concept of heaven as we know it in the West doesn't translate at all to a totally different culture notwithstanding that this white boy did it because that's what white people do uh nevertheless what was interesting about that scene is this right these are the hunter gatherers these people were this this sort of uh culture i'm going to use culture for now right although it's more than that but this sort of culture was on this planet earth for two hundred thousand plus years okay it's been on this culture throughout the whole colonial process, throughout the whole slavery process, throughout the whole ma'afa, all of that. While, while we, you know, me, I'm a descendant of uh, diaspora Africans, right? So while we were in the diaspora getting, you know, whips and chains and all that kind of stuff, and you were like, this the entire existence of the planet, who knows, right? There were these people in, you know, that dense forest, just living their best life hunting and eating meat for centuries, right? At no point, listen to this, at no point did this, now, now this, is, this is something that you really have to, that you really have to understand. At no point in these 200,000 plus years did this, uh, this mythical being, you know, you have to say it's a mythical being, Yahweh, right? At no point did Yahweh communicate with these people in 200,000 years at no point did Yahweh take an interest in these people uh, yet you have to realize too that some of these people could be the ancestors of the people uh, who were taken west you know taken into the diaspora like this boy looks like uh Nate Parker, you know, I know I, I said he was beautiful before. I didn't mean Nate Parker like that, but uh, I don't look at Nate Parker like that. I, I'm just saying this, this child, he, 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 you know, if he were in America, he might be a movie star or something, you know. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this, like uh, some of the people, not all of them, not most of them, maybe just a few, were probably taken from the forest by the agriculturalists. Right, you know, if the, if the white man said, hey, "I need some laborers," and he say, hey, "I know some strong people in the, in, <laughs> I know some strong people, uh, I know some people good at uh, hunting," uh, but you know, that's just speculation. 
the 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 main thing to know though is this that this white god right i shouldn't even use that word but this white uh deity never once contacted these people and the reason why they never did is because they don't exist you know, because, because these people have been receptive. They've been open. They've been, I don't want to say they're open or, or receptive, to be honest. But the reality is that if you're a deity, a magical being that can communicate across time and space and, you know, it's existing from the beginning of the universe, you have absolutely no reason to not talk with these people. Unless you have a bias towards white people. And the white way of life and white social values. There's no, there's absolutely no reason to not like these people. You know, if if I were like, let me go contact some people, right? I would contact them, unless I had some bias against them. And what could that bias be? You understand? Uh, this is this is. Uh, I think that's really interesting. And the fact that they, when they describe what happens when you die and what happens, uh, you know, sure, you know, we see our ancestors. That's, that's nice. But what, what happens when we die and what's all that? It's like, hey, I don't know. I don't know because I wasn't informed by anybody. But here's this. this. This white boy would come in, say, hey, I got to introduce you to this fake, this myth. I got to introduce you to this myth. And when I introduce you to this myth, I'm going to take away your way of being and your culture and you're going to labor for me. But again, we're going to jump into that later, right? We're going to jump into that later. But basically, this right here, this, this video alone should tell you, hey, you know, yeah, you know, I'm not going to mess with Christianity anymore. Because why did this Christian deity never engage these people, walk among these people? Oh, what's your greatest fear? I'm gonna be. Eh, but hey, says him. Says him. But what? Ah, big owl. Let me go. Let me. Big owl. I'm not coma. I says him. I janjai. After dancing with black mambas in my other video, I ask. Well, what about snakes? To me, guy, to me, guy, to me, guy, to me. Yete, kuku. Want the snake bite? This is a snake bite. Niete bao. Do small cutting and they put the. Wow, so this is a snake bite. They and they cut. Hey, kuku. Bepe kuku. Bye, I'm a woman. What kind? What kind of snake? Fifi mo akobok. Fifi mo. Did he get bit by a black mamba? Yeah. He did. Yeah. And this is the mark left from a black mamba after. Damn, man, you're lucky. <laughs> Let's say you see a pretty girl, yeah? Do you, how do you, how does that work? How do, if you want to marry her, do you, what do you have to do? <laughs> <laughs> this question gets a little lost in translation. I ask, what is their biggest struggle? Okay, now pay attention to this right here. Right? So, you know, obviously you see meat, meat, meat. But... He mentions, an, they mentioned another tribe. I think it was the Datoga tribe, okay? Remember, remember, where's Xenophilia? What do the stars and moon mean in the night sky? Okay, so you probably didn't pick up on it, right? But there's another group of people and they are nomads. You know, I've discussed this numerous times about how different, I don't wanna use the word right now, so let me just not, but, but you kind of see, they say, hey, look, there's other people come in and they're nomads and that nomad lifestyle 
interferes with the hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Okay? And that's that's a problem. Zeta. Mm. Zeta. Mm. Okay. So now this was actually pretty important. Sister, what does the moon mean? What does the moon mean? Any guys, the moon? What does the moon mean? It means nothing. Remember, we're the deeply spiritual, you know, everything has meaning, every, we're a part of everything, and everything is everything, and yada yada. And then you ask us, hey, what does the moon mean? It doesn't mean anything, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a floating rock. Cool. Cool. <laughs> After seeing them catch and eat a bat, mongoose, and a hornbill, I asked them if there's any animal they don't eat. So I guess only hyenas are off the menu. I ask if there's anything else, which again is lost in translation. What do you think of city food? <laughs> what you notice that they go to the city. Now, now that's a modern development. The tribe has about 15 dogs that help them hunt, so I asked them, what do dogs mean to you? <laughs> About an hour later, myself and seven Hadzabe hunters raided the baboon camp that was next to ours. It was insanity. Oh my god, he got it! This is crazy, man. This is crazy, man. And it's coming up next week on the channel. <laughs> <laughs> if you've missed the first episode, make sure to go watch it. Okay, so you guys get it. Uh, that was that was the uh, heads of a uh, people, right? Um, interesting to say the least, right? But you know, again, you want to keep note of check onto Job's list, right? Uh, well, this list was created from his language, but. Basically, it's this idea that, you know, we're patriarchal, or matriarchal, we're sedentary and agricultural, we're abundance of vital resources, we're xenophobia, cosmopolitan, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, ideas of peace, justice, goodness, and optimism, and, and literature emphasizing novel tales, fables, and comedy, and you're like, wait a second, wait a moment, you see? Because, again, you know, you talk about this African culture, and you're like, hey, you know, we gotta re embrace our African culture. And it's not to say that, you know, this doesn't exist. Of course it exists. You know, we have this in Egypt. You know, it says that. It's in Egypt, right? Uh, does this exist among other group, uh, individuals, um, other cultures? Of course. You know, the Yoruba, the Ashanti, and so on and so forth. That this does exist. Uh, but if you really want to understand culture, right, you have to understand something else first. And we're going to go into that. But first, I want to show you another video, right? This is going to be the Himba people. Now, a, a brother sent me this on uh, on uh, 
on Twitter. And so I, I, you know, I looked into it and I said, wow, I actually learned quite a bit. So this is going to be pretty good. It's going to be three different clips. And we're going to start off right here at eight minutes. <laughs> Temporary village. We By the way, this is World of Maya. Uh, I, he's traveling a lot, notwithstanding, <laughs> notwithstanding this pandemic. But uh, this is World of Maya. And uh, yeah, he, he goes to Namibia where the Himba people are. And the Himba people are, are known for being beautiful. Apparently, they're also known for being overly, you know, um, yeah. Anyway, but I mean, you can kind of see from the from the title that there's something else going on. But or something else is like a reputation, but uh, this is actually pretty interesting. So, so listen to this. Only go there because of the the grazing. Mm. Yeah. To... So, oh, so you rear cattle in here? Yeah. When we have cattle and goats, either any any type of animals you have, you are farming with, but especially the goats, and then we move them to that to that. Uh, temporary village mm. and when we have to move them oh no sorry i, I, I put it too too late <laughs> because they, they share too they much share, they share the gossip there might have been oh, okay. about uh, what happened what mm. okay so the context is that they wake up what am I at really, really early uh, in order that the men sit together and discuss, you know, things. He's so close to the fire. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's going to move when the fire starts to light up. Wow. Yeah. So in, in most cases here, yeah, uh -huh. it's only for men. Oh. For women, they don't sit on this, on this stone. So what do women sit on? This holy place. They only sit there around the men. Oh. So in men here, they have to share stories. Oh, okay. About uh, what happened, what are we going to do. So most of the stories, we, we, we keep it very secret from women because we believe that women do not have secrets. <laughs> because they, they share too they much. Share, they share, they gossip a lot. Yeah, they gossip yeah, a lot. Yeah, true. Yeah. Maybe we need to go and we need to go to the place. We need to move from here to move all our animals from here to another uh, village. Oh. Yeah, but then we have got like temporary two villages. We have got a permanent one and we have got a temporary one. So a permanent one uh, a permanent one is is like this one. Okay. Yeah, this is a permanent one. But uh, <coughs> a temporary village, we only go there because of the the grazing. Hmm. Yeah. To, so, oh, so you rear cattle in here? Yeah. When we have cattle and goats, either any any type of animals you have, you are farming with, but especially the goats, and then we move them to that to that uh, temporary village, hmm. and when we have to move them. Women are not always friend, uh, friendly with that. They always complain about moving. They don't like to move because they always stay here with the children and things. But when you decide that I'm going to take this and this, so you must keep it secret from them because you don't negotiate with them. You only tell them that we need some girls and maybe can be uh, can be who can can you know like that and then they can make a choice if they are five or six mm. they can make their own choice to move to go which one will go to the temporary village wow so and then you always when you move to that temporary village mm. you always don't want them to spread the news that's why you keep it secret because when their boyfriends come in the night or friends come in the night they will tell because they talk <laughs> women they talk and then they will say no 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 uh, we heard that our father is, is going to move to a, oh. a temporary village uh, to that area to the, maybe to a Chinungwa te uh, temporary village and if you mention a Chinungwa then before you move then the other homestead or the other village will move before you. you so and then they will their animals is going to finish the whole vegetation so it's always good as a good farmer to be the first one in the Together. Area. Yeah. And then you 
wow. you discover all the vegetations and then they eat. I guess um, this is for the animals. Yeah, you this is, yeah. <laughs> You're doing this for the animals. Yeah, we do that for the animals. Yeah. Do you guys worship animals? No. Are they so important to you people? Yeah, animals are important that we use them to our during our ceremonies. You don't sell them? We do now, like in nowadays. But mostly our animals are important not to sell but to do a lot of our ceremonial mm. activities. Mm. Like uh, weddings, like different age of of the of the children, the boys, the girls. The boys mostly they go through circumcision, so we slaughter animals. Uh, the girls they go through um, different stages when they are for the first period, uh, for their first time when they are on period. Uh, they you slaughter animals um, when they have to change different hairstyles. You, you we slaughter animals. What if? Um your son is getting married. Yeah. Do women in here need um, animals or cattle as um, dairy or something? Yeah, we need we need three kettles and two sheep. When your when your boy has to get married. Is there any lady in here who is willing to get married? <laughs> <laughs> He's laughing because he knows that I'm shooting my shot. <laughs> Because, <laughs> <laughs> because you know, like two carrots, two sheep, it's not expensive. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, I can get a wife here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there are a lot, there are a lot single women. I don't know. Maybe you have to talk nicely with them. <laughs> uh, it depends. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was also pretty interesting, right? Uh, what was that scene about? Now, now, actually, I do want to, before we even get into that, the next scene is about him taking one of those himba baths, right? Uh, the himba bath being that they have this particular mineral. Um, like, here, you could kind of see. They have this particular mineral. I don't know why I can't. All right. But they have this particular mineral that they rub around their, that they rub in their bodies, uh, like a mud, clay, and then I guess they peel it off later, and that's a way to shower, Right. That's pretty important for what we're going to discuss later. Right. But that's uh, like that's that's a pretty important thing for the Lord to discuss later. But what, what we just saw was, again, that wasn't a matriarchal community. That wasn't a sedentary community. And of course, you know, when, when he was saying that, and just to give some context to people, when he was saying that the women talk. Yeah. You know, if they have to move to another village, uh, they will probably tell the people that they're dating you know, who are inside of another village, right, that they're going to be unavailable or that they may be available elsewhere, you know? So that's part of, but, you know, of course, you know, like them talking would be something, you know, smart for them to do if they're in relationships with people outside of the village. Uh, but of course, like like uh, the guy was saying, if you're telling people outside of the village, what are your plans for, uh, you know, your cattle, right, your animals, and if you know, then you're gonna give away the plant. So you know, it's it's a little mixture. But again, you don't see this uh, matriarchy, right? You don't see this matriarchy that 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 Jope is talking about. Now, you could look at the two cradle theory as this is the agricultural model versus the nomadic model, right? But that's not to say that there's a ferocious warlike, or or is there? Uh, notwithstanding. Uh, none of these these qualities are there, right? Uh, they, they, they seem like nice people, you can say, right? But let's jump forward to, I think it's 1730, okay? 17 minutes and 30 seconds in, right? Uh, and we're going to have a little bit more insight. So this is him getting his uh, clay bath or whatever. And again, this is a mineral that's found in this location. Very important. I really want to know mm -hmm. who are the people of Himba. Mm -hmm. So these people, 
the Himba group or the Himba tribe is a, is a nomadic group. So they live from their animals. Their animals are the only source of living. So they have no much influence or they had no influence of modern nations. Wow. Where did they migrate from? They migrate from uh, southern west of Angola. When they came in here, who are the people that were present in here? Uh, they were Bushmen, which are sand people. The Bushmen left and gave them the land? Uh, uh, they leave a place because of the pressure. Uh, as they handed uh, the, the, the cows of the Himba people, and the Himba they were so mad at the Bushmen because they were killing cows. So they had um, uh, a little bit of fight. Then uh, Bushmen, they were a bit uh, defeated. They moved in the southern and eastern part of the country. And the Himba settled. They remain, they settle. Yeah. The over Himba are polygamous. So, you got that, right? Uh, the Himba people meet the, I think he said the Khoisan, right? I, I, I don't know why I just blanked out. But uh, they meet the Khoisan, or the San, inside of the area. And they say, uh, the San people are the hunter-gatherers. So remember how you just saw the, uh, the, the Hadzabe people talking about the Dagoda people, right? And they're like, oh, the Dagoda people are herders and, you know, they chase away the wild animals, right? Now, it could be that the hunter-gatherers say, hey, that cow is meat, right? The cow is meat. So I'm going to hunt the meat because you know how hunter-gatherers are thinking. You should know by now, right? Uh, the nomads, however, with their lifestyle surrounding their, cat, their, their, their herd, they say, whoa, 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 you stop this or we'll kill you, right? Now, again, we have this xenophobia, sorry, the xenophilia that's allegedly a characteristic of us as African people. And yet, in reality we see these sort of clashes that occur, right? And I mean, this doesn't stop with uh, the hunt of the nomads, you know? Uh, in, like, it's well known. Well, this is one of the earliest things I knew about Africa, even before I was, you know, if you want to call me conscious or whatever, right? Even before this, I was, you know, just a young brother in uh, college, university. And I took an African history studies course or whatever, and we were told we were we, we were reading about different uh, cultures. Let's let's use cultures for now, right? Where the agriculturalists would fight the nomads. You know. Now think of it this way: the nomad needs grazing land. The uh, agriculturalist needs two things, however, right? The agriculturalist needs trees needs needs trees right in order to build homes right the agriculturalist also needs land in order to make crops if the herders bring their their cattle onto your you know your lettuce land or whatever right you're not gonna be able to grow any lettuce right because the cow is gonna eat it you don't want that that's gonna be a clash all right uh if the nomad, if the if the hunter, sorry, if the if the agriculturalist wants to uh, get in the tree, like, get get tree, you know, cut down trees for the forest or whatever, right? I mean, sorry, cut down trees in order to build uh, homes or whatever, right? The hunter is not going to like that because if, if you guys were paying attention to the the hunting of the the chimps, the chimps are hanging out in the trees. The chimps are, you know, the animals are are you could sneak up on an animal. If you're sneaking up through the forest, you can't really sneak up on a plane, right? Uh, you can't run as fast as a, as a, as a, as a lion or, or, or a leopard or, or what have you, right? Uh, now, obviously, the, uh, the next economy or another economy uh, that's even stronger. Than, and, you know, if, if you want to, all right, let me give you this. If you want to go by the power or the strength of each one, the, the nomad is stronger than the hunter-gatherer, Okay. The, you know, you, you, as you heard, the hunter-gatherers are dwindling now. But, but even when they're large, notwithstanding, you, you're still, the nomad is stronger. The agriculturalist is even stronger than the nomad, okay? Uh, with few exceptions, right? Uh, and, you know, we have this nomad agricultural uh, 
conflict going on in, in northern Nigeria right now, right? Uh, especially with climate change shrinking uh, the water supply, right? Uh, and, and the things that come along with that. Uh, after that, you have the people who are causing climate change who are actually really strong, and they're the industrialists, right? So the industrialists, uh, they also would do deforestation to a large degree, okay? Uh, because their, their trees can form paper. You know, they don't just need houses. They want to make paper, you know? And they want resources out of the land and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to go into that very soon. I just want to show you one more clip from this. This one's this one's actually pretty long too, but um, I think it's going to be pretty informative. So this is oh yeah yeah this one. <laughs> okay, this is a this is just a funny one. All right, check this out. Put a kettle or sheep. I have to put a fresh yeah branch yeah. So I, if yeah. I can count yeah. You guys have been slotting one two three. Okay, my own is four. <laughs> so what happens is we're gonna just see. Um, what am I uh, eat some food? Uh, this is going to be the food that they prepare at uh, in in the Himba village. <laughs> what? This this is gonna be lunch. Cause they will cook it. They will cook it for the oh uh, almost like for three hours. It will be prepared nice cooked Himba way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to prepare it the Himba way. We don't put salt, we don't do anything. We only cook until the meat is well nice cooked. You don't put salt? We don't put salt. Do you put pepper? We don't put pepper. What do you put then? Nothing, water only. Only water? Yes. Just watch. While the food is on fire and getting ready to be served, they all come together to play. And this kind of game deserves a lot of energy. <laughs> Hey, what do I start with? <laughs> Just to clarify, they do this for about three hours, right? We sit over there and then we eat, okay? Wow. The yeah. same table they used to slaughter the goats. <laughs> is it is a table? You see, it's just to protect the things from dust, you know? Okay. That's that's the important of that. Okay. Can we get water to wash our hands now? Yeah, water is here, water is here. <laughs> wash, wash. No, but I, I wash my hand, is the red that is coming out. Okay. Oh my goodness. You, you see the, the okra is not... It's, it's, it's still on my hand. Uh, okra is healthy, man. It's healthy? Yeah. Are you sure about that? Yeah. yeah then uh, why do I have to wash my hands then? No, okay. no, it's just to take off the dusty bit, yeah. Okay. But okra itself is healthy. <laughs> you, see, we, you see when children are sick, <laughs> they're babies. <laughs> we, we put okra... So look, I want you to just pay attention to 
these guys faces while he's eating and you know this is more so just like this is pretty interesting in water we let them drink and then they are okay in their stomach so okra so this was cooked just with water yeah with water only water only yeah okay yeah and this is pop eh? yeah that is pop okay yeah i'm gonna taste it i'm gonna tell you guys how it tastes like that yeah no, just, just have a bite, sure, come on. No pepper, bro. No salt. Ah, okay. <laughs> this is a new thing, you just have to get used to it, man. Yeah. And that is healthy, man. Pepper, pepper make you sick and those No, two, uh, okay. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, they make you sick. <laughs> but this, this one, original cooked one, is, it doesn't make you sick, you know. Men on their own, man. And how often do they eat this food? So how often? often? Yeah. Oh, every day. Every day. Every day. So this is like a daily meal yeah. for the people of yeah. Himba. Yeah. Amazing. Every man. day, every day. Alright. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all right. So, I mean, just, to, you know, I, I, I do want to share this. Somebody saw this video and they were like, uh, why did they spend that much time dancing instead of, uh, you know, getting spices or something, right? Uh, I thought it was a funny comment. But, yeah, that's pretty important, right? What we just saw was pretty important, you know, and I included it mostly because, you know, we are world-renowned for, you know, spicing our food. Uh, this last thing, and th I, I think that's the last of YouTube. This is just going to be a clip. Uh, basically, I was kind of rude on... I, I, I put something on Twitter where uh, somebody put up something. This this lady's uh, at Mimi Reed. Uh, I said, not going to lie, I hope I never get so lost that this is the only available food. And actually, hold on a second. Let me see if you guys can see. I'm just going to double check this screen. Yeah. All right. So not going to lie, I hope it's not the only food. And so this is just people eating bugs. You know, this is just another thing altogether. They have bugs that they will eat. They will cook <laughs> bugs and eat it. You don't have to see it, to be honest. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's the gist of everything I wanted to show you. So what can I say, right? We talk about this African culture. We talk about this agricultural uh, existence, the sedentary, this matriarchal, this, uh, uh, you know, go, go down the list of what Joe was telling us. This is who we are. And then these are examples of African people who do not fit this model. Okay? So the thing is this. You know, one of the things, one of my favorite things, in fact, about uh, uh, Frances Cress Welsing's book is that she starts off with this ambition. You know? Uh, basically, there's this uh, gentleman. Well, I shouldn't say gentleman. But there's this guy named uh, Albert Einstein. Okay? He wants to find a universal, you know, theory uh, of, of, you know, whatever, right? Um, he's trying to, you know, combine all these theories, right? Universal law, whatever, blah, 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 right? And so Francis Chris Welting says, yeah, I want to do the same thing in psychology. And that sounds great, right? Uh, but I said, you know, I like that she had that kind of ambition, you know? I think that's a good place to start off with. When we say something like African culture, we have to, you know, it behooves us to say something and then it doesn't apply. It's not as universal as we thought. It's not, it's not really real. And if it's not really real, then you have to throw it out and redo and remake something that fits the sciences. So actually, I want to say this. I'm going to open up the Book of Power, Okay. So the Book of Power is really interesting insofar as I was able to find something out uh, many years later only because I chose to preserve it, right? So we're going to open up the Book of Power. Just give me two seconds to get that open, right? We're going to go to page... We're going to go to page 151, all right? And just to scroll up, I'm going to show you how it looks on the, on the screen. Just to scroll up, scroll up. This is Leonard Jeffrey's CAPS, page 150. This is CAPS, Concepts, Analysis, and Processes and Systems. You know, this, this was something that was really amazing for me. All right. When I was younger, I was a part of the United African Movement. I told you guys this many times. Uh, Leonard Jeffries came to speak to us. 
And he started breaking down how economics, politics, and culture are related and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and really going into it to the point where I'm, you know, 20 years old or something. And I'm like, I've never heard something so deep, so powerful. I'm writing it down inside of my little notebook. And I'm like, wow, I'm just in a special place. I can't believe I've never heard something like this. And I probably never hear anything like this again. Fortunately, though, I went online and looked up Leonard Jeffries. Uh, and I found that he was speaking about this same concept over and over again. So, of course, I put paper to pen and I transcribed it and put it in the Book of Power. And really, like, like, like this is one of those fundamental things for me. And I can appreciate the fact that I put it in the Book of Power because uh, I was able to revisit it. You know, and that's one of the most important things about books is the fact that you can revisit the literature. Uh, this is something that you really can't do in other in other in other media, you know, uh, like if I said something today or something and you asked me about it in, in, in five years, I'd be like, I don't I don't know which one of my lectures I've spoken about that on. But if 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 you say if you ask me, you know, hey, uh, what about that quote that you have of Leonard Jeffries? I say, oh, yeah, it's in the book. It's indexed. You know what I mean? I got a table of contents. I know where Leonard Jeffries said something. You know, I know Leonard Jeffries said it, so I'm going to go and find it pretty quickly by looking through his available literature. And so, like, again, this is going to be a really powerful thing. I'm going to read it with you. But before I do, I really want you to remember to check out the other programs on KWZ Radio. This is D-Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro-Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to break it down and make it even simpler. All right. So he says, and then you have to understand systems. Systems is the linkages of everything. If even a small number of us decided to operate in a systemic way, we could change our cities because we would reach out to other people like us. We would hook them up into a system of development. When you're talking about development, you're talking about three important areas. Any developmental process, whether it's your personal development, your family development, your community development, or your national development, has to involve, first and foremost, the economic principles. Economics is the first principle because you have to have productivity and creativity in order to be. But the first principle of economics begets politics. Politics becomes a complementary principle because you have to have management capability of your economics, which is your productive capability. And when you relate to your economics and your politics, you are linking your ecology to your sociology, the living systems that come out of your political management process. We're talking about systems analysis. This is what Eurasians gave me, and now we can use it against him. Economics becomes the first principle. Politics becomes a complementary principle. And these become the foundation of any building you're going to do. But the cement that holds it together is culture. Culture becomes the psychological dimension, just as economics is the ecological dimension and politics is the sociological dimension. Culture is the cement that holds it together. Culture are the values that allow you to pass on your traditions from generation to generation to keep your economics and keep your politics intact. This dimension of economics, politics, and culture is what we are missing. Other groups come to get, come among us, and they have in place their economics, politics, and culture, so they're able to uh, come into your community. And even though they may be from devastated populations, they come with their economics, politics, and culture intact, and they are able to instantly build based upon your consumerism. They can be distant enslavers who don't care anything about you. But they come into your community with their economics, their politics, and their culture intact, and they're able to profiteer on your confusion and your disunion. This is what we're talking about. You cannot do it without economics, politics, and culture in a systemic relationship. All right. It was deep. I'm telling you, it's deep. It's a lot of language. It's a lot of words, right? Now, how does that apply to 
the southern model we've read about in um, in Jope. How does that apply to the Himba people? And how does that apply to the Hadzabe people? Right? If this is real, how does it apply to anybody? Right? And here's what it is. Right? The thing is that when I first heard this, I was like, is it economics first? Or is it culture first? Is it politics first? Is it culture? Is it economics first? Is it, you know, you know, I didn't know. I was like, I heard him say this. And the thing is this, I want to say this. He was right. It's economics first. You know, the, the thing is that when you say hunter-gatherer, you're talking about an economic system. When you say uh, uh, nomads, you're talking about an economic system. When you're talking about agriculturalists, you're talking about an economic system. The reason why they have three different cultures, right, even though they're all African, the reason why they have three different cultures is because they have three different economic systems, right? Now, this is, this is really fundamental. I, I mean, of course, you know, it's common sense. Everything I say is common sense. You know, nobody's going to be impressed with anything I say because everything I say is common sense, right? Or it should be common sense. You know, I, I'm going to put it to you plainly. But when I say economics, I want you to understand what economics is. And I'm going to say it really, really simple. I'm going to keep it very, very simple. Because you just heard uh, uh, Leonard Jeffries discuss what economics was. And you probably didn't understand it. You know, I'm not going to front. When I put this in the book, I didn't necessarily understand it completely. You understand? That's why I like that I put it in the book, because then I could turn back and be like, you know, because here's the thing. Look, this, this, this is available online on YouTube. You know, I transcribed this from YouTube. I had to type every word that he was saying uh, while he was saying it. Uh, I couldn't tell you what video. I mean, I could look at my history and find the video. I couldn't tell you the timestamp. I'd have to listen to the whole thing. Of course, I could always pull up the transcript and try to find it uh, via that. But the point is that this is the easiest way to do it. This is why I like books. You know, you just open the book, turn to the page, read through it. And these are short, this is a short little clip of it. You know, this is one, two, three, four pages. You know, so it's like, oh, I don't know where it's one, where it is. I know it's, you know, I just look through four pages. It's not that complicated. I'm not going to lose. And of course, you know, I, I capitalize these words. So it's not like it's going to be hard for me to find it. Uh, either way. You have this, right? I'm gonna sum, I'm gonna simplify economics into three words. Then I'm gonna simplify politics into three words and culture into three words. I shouldn't say three words, three concepts, okay? But it's gonna be like one sentence, right? So the three words for economics is survive, thrive, and individual. Okay? That's it. Three words for economics is survive, thrive, and individual. Those are the three concepts you have to understand, right? You already understand what survival is. Right? Just survive. How do you survive? You already understand thrive. That's going beyond surviving. Right? And you already understand what an individual is. That's what you are. And I'm going to give this. I'm going I'm to give some appreciation. A shout out to uh, uh, Jay Rogers. Jay Rogers is a nice ancestor. Uh, he wrote this book called From Superman to Man. And, you know, I, I told you guys before, I decided to read uh, the first 10 pages. You know, to refresh my writing, I tried to read the first 10 pages of From Superman to Man. Uh, Martin Delaney's, uh, uh, no, from John, J, John Edward Bruce's Superman to Man, from Superman to Man, uh, Martin Delaney's uh, Blake on the Hearts of America, and of course my own Zuberi and the Moons of my Eye, right? I decided to read these three books, the first 10 pages, in order to like refresh my writing ability, and I came across this interesting idea inside of uh, from Superman to Man. He, you know, for what it's worth, Jay Rogers was not, you know, as racially, you know, like charged as the rest of us. You know what I mean? Like he was kind of like, oh, there's no such thing as a human race. You know, we're all individuals. And that individual idea, he really, he brilliantly expresses it. He brilliantly shares it. And to a point where it has, like, you notice it does have some legitimacy. And so when we're talking about economics, you have to realize economics is, uh, how an individual survives and thrives. Okay? That's six words. How an individual survives and thrives. Let me break it down for you. When If you go to the Himba people, how do they survive? Oh, they, they get meat. They get food. They go hunting. Uh, you, no, sorry. Sorry. The Hadzabe. They, go, they get meat. They go hunting. They get food. Right? How do they thrive? They get big game. They get big animals. Right? What about the Himba? How do they survive? They got a herd. You know, you got a herd, 
you know, you survive in the, you survive, you keep, you take care of your, you keep care of your animals or whatever, right? How do you thrive? You get a large, a large herd, you know? And, and of course, if you have a large herd or, or you, you, you get a large game among the uh, Hadzabe, you get respect. You see, they, they have this economy, right? They have this economy and so they get respect based off of how they thrive in that economic system. So then now let's jump forward. Uh, okay, this is a little bit more. Than this. this is nine words, right? Politics. Now, now remember, it, it, economics is how an individual survives and thrives. Okay, that's it. Six words. Nine words. Politics. Politics is how an economy survives and thrives despite other individuals. You see? So I'm going to break it down for you. Right. So the, the Hadzabe, right, the politi the politics of their econ economy is such that, you know, an individual may go out and hunt and get some food. Right. Now, you go, you hunting together the same animal and you share that food. That's your political structure. You hunting, uh, you hunting, and then the, 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 the Goda, or I can't remember the name of them, but the other group of people come in and they're like, hey, move out, all the animals, clear, We're, we have these, uh, whatever. You now have a political relationship with them, right? You know, one of hostility sometimes. Or, you know, to give the, the, more, the, the, the more expressed example, the Himba and the San, you know, the Himba being hunter-gatherers, they're hunting animals, so on and so forth, and the and the and the, no, sorry, the, the San are hunting gatherers, and they are, uh, you know, just collecting animals or whatever, right? They're they're they're, they're hunting animals. Then they see a cow, and their political structure is such that, you know, one of their individuals uh, hunts an animal of the Himbas. The Himbas, one of their individuals, engages the. Uh, the 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 San as a group and 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 chases them off the land. They go to war, they fight, they kill some San people and say, get out of here, go south. That's why they're in South Africa. Okay? That's the politics. That their economy, what 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 the political relationship between the two is that the 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 Himba make their political their economy their economic system of herding survive and thrive despite the San people. You understand? Now the San people make a political decision to move to southern Africa where the herders are not chasing them. Maybe they, they connect with the Koi. Maybe that's why they're Khoisan. You see? Politics is how an economy survives and thrives despite other individuals. Now, what is it that I want to say uh, outside of that? Oh, yeah. So now culture. So what is the culture? Culture is where, and I'm not going to count the words, right? Oh, yeah, so, so, sorry, I put it, so culture is just, now, when I give you culture in, in these three concepts, you're going to have to give me some flowers, okay? you got to give me some flowers. A lot, a lot of times, black folk only give people flowers, oh, I shouldn't say black folk, right? But a lot of times, you know, we tend to give each other flowers after we pass, but this right here is actually pretty deep, so you got to give me my flowers right now, all right? Uh, but it says, look, flowers is how politics survives and thrives despite other groups. He said it. He said it. So, so, so look, <laughs> again, you, simple concept. Indi economics, how an individual survives and thrives, right? Politics, how an economy survives and thrives despite other individuals. And culture, how politics survives and thrives despite other groups. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? So now the Himba, right? The Himba. No, no, no. Sorry. You have two groups, right? You have the, the, the hunter-gatherer, right? And you have the, the nomad, right? Now, the, the, let's say the himba and the sign, right? You have the himba and the sign. Now, you have another individual. You have individuals in another group who are, have a different economic system, and they're, they're thriving in their economic system, right? You don't want... Or in fact, if you want your economic system to flourish, you're going to need those individuals within your group to stay within your group. 
You understand? You're going to need those individuals within your group to stay within your group. Like, like give you an example. You see that little boy in the first thing? I tell you, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a beautiful little boy, right? Uh, in order for the, what keeps him in that cult, like what keeps him in that uh, economy is that culture. You understand? The culture that you have is basically how you can keep that political relationship. How you can make that po the politics survive and thrive despite how other groups have. So basically now your culture is saying, hey, these are this is who what we are. We are these people and they are those people. And you'll notice that every, almost like nearly every cultural expression goes along these lines of having your political relationship and basically your economy survive and thrive. So one thing I want to say, right? You go to, now we go into, into the world, right? And I mean, I'm not going to say this was the best explanation, right? Uh, but you are going to get it. I want you to think. I want you to think. So you see the relationship between economics, politics, and culture, and how it really, it's really about surviving and thriving. And so we're going to fast forward to the Yoruba. Yoruba have this beautiful artwork. They have this beautiful art design. If you do a study, the main thing to realize is that the culture is derivative of the economy. That's the main thing to get through your head, right? Or, or, or even like this, you know, the himba. I, I said we're going to talk about it. The himba are, are bathing in mud or something, right? And it doesn't make any sense. But why are they doing it? Because that's a local resource. One of the things we, we you overlook is how uh, Leonard Jeffries says ecology is, is, is the fundamental, right? Ecology then sociology, then psychology, right? Ecology basically means this, right? That the reason why they're bathing in mud is because it's there. The reason why the hunter-gatherers are hunting, right? Their culture is to hunt, right? Their culture is to, is to, is to chase down baboons and, you know, they maintain it. You know, meat is so important. Meat, and honey, and porridge, these are very important things. You know, and this is what we do. We don't like city food. You notice he said that. They said we don't like city food. The himba, what did they say? Oh yeah, we don't like city food. We don't like other type of food. We don't we don't do seasoning. Why don't why don't they do seasoning? Because there's no salt or pepper where they're at. You understand? Know they would have to trade for salt and pepper. You know, like 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 one of the things we 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 learn, you know, all of us, most of us especially if you study any like basic African history, is that there were African kingdoms that monopolized the salt trade. They had salt mines in their territory. If you were not a part of that empire, you did not have salt unless you traded with them. And if you don't have anything to trade or anything of value, then you just went without salt and you made it your culture. Your culture and you enjoyed it. You know, uh... If you guys saw, what's his name's face? Uh, what am I's face? He was not impressed. You know? But the, uh, but the gentleman was like, you may never heard taste something like this before. And what am I was like, I did. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, but, but you get it. You get it. There's the culture. Is that our politics are going to survive and thrive. If we, if we, uh, if we eat our food without seasoning, right, then we don't need to trade with other people and we could be dependent on animals. If we dance, uh, like, like, like you get it, all right? The, the Yoruba art, right? If you study the Yoruba, Yoruba people, this came about after a food surplus. When you're agriculturalist, you are able to produce much more food to the point where, like, like much more food than hunter-gatherers or, or, or uh, nomads can produce, right? Uh, to the point where you now have a surplus population, okay? When you have a surplus population for the land that you're uh, farming, in a sense, people need to find other employment. 
And so because they need to find other employment, that's one of the reasons why uh, the Yoruba engaged in this sort of advanced art. But it ties back to the food surplus, right? So, and actually, I forgot to show you guys about the tell you guys about the uh, bug eating part. You know, the bug eating part was uh, pretty interesting, but uh, that just tells you, yeah, that's that's an economy that collapsed. That's an economy that said, hey, look, we're not, we're not, you know, we value it as culture. Notice, you know, like like here's the thing. Okay, so I didn't show you guys that part, but you know, I showed the sister. I mean, I, I commented on that sister's post, and then she gave me a thumbs down. Like, she was like, yeah, I'm deeply offended. Uh, right here, you can see oh, a lot of people <laughs> making jokes about it. But, uh, oh, I'm not even sharing the screen. Um, let me see which one is it, this one. Right? Um, so, you know, some people are like, yeah, no, no. But this sister who put it, she said, that's a trash take. That's a trash take. And shout out to Young Lero. She said she would... You know, she said a little bug won't hurt. You know, it's a good protein. I don't know about that. Uh, this brother said, uh, Farrah Cody said, uh, I, I ate a few worms there, but I hope we preserve animal stock. Yeah. But like this is a, it's a trash take, you know, and that's fine. I mean, I, I did it, you know, just because I'm, you know, I'm that guy. But, but you know, you, you, you would, you, people are saying, hey, that's my culture. That's my culture. That's how I, but, but realistically speaking, that's just an economy that went wrong. And if you remember from your chance at Williams, destruction of black civilization, that's, uh, that's something that, that happened to us often, you know, where if you are chased off the land and, and, you know, like, like, let's say the San people, the San people were able to go into, you know, after they're chased out of Angola, they were able to go into South Africa and hunt. But like, what if you weren't able to go to another place and hunt, you know, what if there's no food available, then you would eat insects. And if you ate insects enough, you would uh, you don't want people to abandon you. You you talk about how good it is in protein and and yada, yada and the health and blah, blah, blah. And eventually, you know, it becomes your culture. Right. You don't want the individuals abandoning you. You want people to survive and thrive and feel useful. And that's uh, what it is. So let's go back to this uh, list. You guys can't see the list, but, uh, you know, you have the Europe of the art food surplus. The Kemichu. They're sciences. What is it from? The annual flooding of the Nile. Again, there's the economy and then the culture, right? And then, of course, Shaka Zulu, his warship his, was his resistance to the foreign invaders in Africa. There was an economy. That's also an economy thing, too. How do you survive and how do you th thrive? By resisting the foreign invaders. And I'm going to give you this, too. The Pan-Africanist consciousness that we all like, we all love, and we say, "Hey, that's a, something of really valuable." If you really look at it from an economic standpoint, and which is the only standpoint you should look at it from, right? It was a result of colonization. It was a response to colonization. How do you survive and thrive in a colonial economy? How would you thrive when you couldn't thrive? Well, you would fight against the colonizer. And that's what Pan-African nationalism is at its core. But that's not a real economy, right? So let's get into it. What is it? What's an economy? What is the economy of the West? What is the economy of the West that Pan-African consciousness has uh, developed in, right? That's something that I really, really have to discuss. And so we're going to get into it. The economy in the West is to survive by working and thrive by serving okay and it's so infectious that it makes a new culture out of us and I actually want to show you this is what I would consider a failure on our part right I want to show you this let's see if I can jump to it really quick um, this is pretty interesting so this this brother puts up a uh, something on Twitter right and it's pretty impressive. And of course, I'm going to give him a jerk response, but it is what it is, right? He says, it's a shortage. Let me see if, let me see if you guys can see it. Yeah. He says, it's a shortage of mechanics, electricians, welders, H, VAC, plumbers, truck drivers, etc. That's why so many companies are now paying 80K plus with a sign-on bonus. Us black men can really take over all these industries of if we want to right um 
So, so this gentleman, I don't know who he is. I don't care to know who he is, to be honest. But it's pretty interesting to see this. Like you got, I, I got lucky today. You know, this this showed up. Sorry, I'm print, I'm I'm recording this on September third. Um, but I got lucky. You know, this just showed up on my TL, and I was like, what? That's 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 a terrible take. So I wrote this guy. And I was like, working for others isn't taking over the industry. Because I really want us to understand economics, right? Working for others isn't taking over the industry, okay? It's taking under. But this is a good idea insofar as black men being labor was always a good idea in America. I sound sarcastic, but I'm serious. And I'm quote tweeting to boost the message. You know... What thing you got to realize, then I, then I quote, <laughs> then like a real uh, jerk, right? Uh, I shouldn't say jerk, but you know, like, 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 like that guy, you know, I quote Chancellor Williams. I say, no systematic effort towards change has been possible for taught the same economics, history, philosophy, literature, and religion, which have established the present code of morals. The Negro's mind has been brought under the control of his oppressor. The problem of holding the Negro down, therefore, is easily solved. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him to stand here or go yonder. He will find his proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary. What? Uh, of course, the brother, the brother is, takes it from the chin. You know, and I, you know, he takes it nicely. He says, we can start our own companies for our own people. And, of course, I say, without sarcasm, that's taking over. Make it happen. Best of luck. You can do it. You know, I, I try to be positive, right? But the reason why I even retweeted this because I said this is a good example of people misunderstanding economics, right? Because I just told you the economics of the West, right, is to serve no, to, to, sorry, the economics is, again, how do you survive? How does an individual survive and thrive? This individual said, hey, you know, we as black people can survive by working for this white boy and thrive by serving him. We can survive and thrive by becoming his laborers like he brought us here to be. And it reminded me of that Chancellor Williams, uh, sorry, not Chancellor Williams, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, right? Carter G. Woodson, who said, that we would go to the back door even if there's no back door, right? We will do what we were told to do. We will do what we were supposed to do. And of course, you know, I can't hate on this. Why can't I hate on this? Because this is the economy that you exist in in the West. The economy that you exist in in the West is to work and serve white folk. Work for and serve white folk. That's what it is, right? That's what it is. And if you must understand that now, 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 when you understand that as the economy, right, you realize why it's so helpless or hopeless in the West, right? You realize why it's so hopeless because that's all like because the way to survive and thrive. Because I'll, I'll give you this: the himba and the and the uh, and the uh, uh, the hadzabe are more respectable. Now, now, I actually heard from a westerner right a western person who saw those two examples and was like eh, you know like 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 with the hezabe you know the reference was made to there's only 1500 of them left and you know you know like like basically it's not a tear or whatever right uh which is sad right but uh well sad for me but it was like yeah who cares right um that's very important because the difference between them and us in the West is that they are of independent economies from the West and therefore independent cultures. Whereas we, on the other hand, you go back to this example, have dependent cultures and because we have dependent economies. Us black men can get paid 80K. You understand? Who's going to pay us? 80K. White boy. The, the, the culture, the, the, the recommendation is, hey, you know what? We can really do something of high value for these white folk. 
But but we are way bigger in number. I mean, I just told you there's 1,500 at Zabe. They're independent. There's 40 million black folk in America alone. Uh, maybe close to a billion. Uh, no, 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 I shouldn't say that. But maybe like 200, 500 million. Let's let's say 500 million. Uh, Africans of of, of 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 urban urban Africans, who are if you understand this right, we go to neocolonialism. What's neocolonialism? It's the same Western economy of surviving by working and thriving by serving. What neocolonialism, right? And this is a you know, like I said, go read Fanon, right? Uh, re, you know, go listen to my my, my discussion on Fanon. But Fanon really describes, hey, you know what? The reality of neocolonialism is this. You had the colonizer. Now, now remember what co colonies are. Colonies started off as corporations, right? Basically, if, if I were to open up a corporation for white folk, right? Let's say I'm white people, right? I open up a corporation, right? A business. A business of getting uh, resources from from a land, right? Uh, so if I'm getting resources from a land, uh, abroad, right, I'll have to make a city for them. Right? I'll have to make a living area for them. And I will have to enlist, maybe not have to, but I would enlist the help of, of, of individuals in that location, okay? Uh, particularly if they need, if they want it, right? And they might want it if you kick them off their land. Like you take the, if you take the himba off their land, right? For whatever reason, right? You take the hemp off their land, or you take the, or you, or let's say more realistic, because people think we're all descended from, you know, you know, uh, agriculturalists, right? You take the Ashanti off their land, okay? Uh, you take them off their land. Now, if they were depending on their land to survive, that was their independence, right? Now they don't have that land. How are they going to survive? Well, they're going to work for you, right? That's you just took away their economy. You took away their culture, honestly, right? But you, you, you know, they're, they're now uh, in your land, surviving on your land or whatever, right? You, you build a city for yourself, okay? You build a city for yourself and you let them work within your city and you work within that city and you're in proximity, so on and so forth. These are the nations that were born out of Africa. These, these are the nations. They're just corporations, corporate towns that became cities, and here's what happened with neocolonialism. Let's say you have a CEO, right? You know, sorry, you have upper management and lower management, all right? Of any business, you have upper management, lower management, and the workers, right? Well, not every business, but let's just say typically you would have upper management, lower management, and the workers. The upper management were the foreigners, right? The lower management were the, uh, let's say, um, let's say the, the, the elites, Okay. And the, and the workers were just the commoners, okay? Uh, the, the local elites. They weren't too elite, but they were local elites, right? The, the, uh, they, they were better off than the workers, okay? Better off than the commoners, all right? Now, what happened in colonialism was that you took out the, uh, the uh, upper management, right? Now, after you take out the upper management, what, what happens is this. The lower management has a choice, Okay? Lower management could say, you know what, this whole operation is stupid. We're going to get rid of it and we're going to do something else, right? Or the lower management could say, you know what, I was always envious of upper management. Upper management is now gone. I'm going to get their same paychecks, right? Now, when you do that, you have a problem because the whole system was built on selling resources to the West, okay? Now, I, 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 in my notes, I was supposed to describe this a little bit earlier. I'm surprised I didn't. But here's what it is. I'm going to describe it this way. For the white man, colonialism is survive by working and thrive by exchanging resources for currency. Right? And so basically you bring gold. Like let's say you're an English company. You would, or, you know, company, colony, corporation, whatever you want to call it. They're all the same thing. You're an English colony, and you can even think of it like, like, hey, you, you set up McDonald's, and you have uh, upper management from the West, right? Uh, you, you know, just uh, this is just McDonald's. It's not even, you know, this is not realistic, realistic. But you set up McDonald's or whatever, right? You, you, you have that in another country. You then have to supply uh, food, 
clothing and shelter for the people who work at McDonald's, right? Who are from abroad. And then you're also going to have employees among the people who work below, and that's why you're the upper management, and they're the lower management, and blah, 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 right? Uh, you know, the translator, the blah, 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 right? Uh, of course, that's not what it was for Africa, where Africa was really, was, you know, trading companies, trading corporations. So they are trying to get the resources, and they're going to send them to, uh, to the West, you know, turn them back to their native countries for currency, money. And that money is going to what is money good for it's good for access to western goods and services that's what money is good for right now the capitalists and the other country will thrive by transforming raw materials into finished goods and selling them for what currency which is again access to western goods and services remember your money is only good for western goods and services okay that's all it's good for right if i have yuan you know the chinese uh Currency, I think it's yuan, who cares, right? But if I have that, it's only good in China for Chinese goods and services. So if I'm exchanging resources for Chinese currency, then of course I'm going to be patronizing the Chinese, right? And that's the problem with the Western, the neocolonialism. What happens in neocolonialism is that you have this corporation that you now take over and you take it over and the whole operation is, hey, you want my oil? Here's my oil. Here's your oil. Now you give me money, and you give me this money, and all the money is good for is access to your markets. That's all the money is good for, for your goods and services. That's all it's good for. So, of course, you say to yourself, hey, man, these, uh, these Africans, well, they're buying cars. They're buying cars with their money, and they're doing this with their money, and doing that with their money. Well, duh. You can't use the money for anything. It's just paper. You understand? Now, 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 now you might say to yourself, well, why didn't you just destroy the whole colonial system? Like, you, you beat the colonial system. Why don't you just destroy it and make your own economy? Yeah, sure. This is urban problem, though. And I really wanted to uh, express that. The urban problem is this. When you're in a city, notice this. When you're in a city, you're actually dependent on the rural area. You're dependent. Why are you dependent? Because you are landless. You are powerless. When you're in a city, you're powerless. You're landless. You know, like 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 that like 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 the Hezabe people when they get hungry, they go out and get some food, right? When the uh, when the uh, when the when the Himba people are hungry, they go out and they kill a sheep or something, right? When the agriculturalist is hungry, they go out and they pick up their garden, right? When the urban person is hungry, right? They have to go to the market. You understand? And, and the reality is this, the urban problem is this, that you don't produce enough food for landless people. When you're in a city, you have to import food because you do not produce enough food for, ur for landless people. And the, and the thing that you have to know is that the urban areas are the most population dense areas on the planet. You know, like, like, the, like the, the Hezabe people, they're, they're population dense per se, but if it depends on what kind of area you're, 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 you're talking about. You know, the hunting grounds for the Hedzabe is this huge... You saw the forest. It's this huge forest, right? So the population density is like one person per, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, for the Himba people, again, they have a small village, but it's, it's a huge amount of land when you consider how their economy works, right? For the agriculturalists, you know, you have this, you have this, this big amount of land per family, uh, you know, in order to feed them, so on and so forth, right? If they're subsistence farmers, right? But for the urban person... They are crammed together next door to each other. They're not producing food. So if you have to survive as an urbanite, notwithstanding uh, the fact that you don't produce any food, you have all sorts of problems. You know, that's an, eco that's an economics problem that we did not solve and we couldn't solve. Because one thing you have to know about these colonies is that they depended on importing food from the west you know if, if you if you if you're you know i just use the mcdonald's example which is unrealistic but the thing is this that if you did have a a colony right like like let's just say it this way if you're a european and you go to another country right what kind of food do you want to eat you want to eat european food right so you have this deal to get rice from the european farmers back home now, after upper management is kicked out, the Europeans are kicked out, 
it, the fact that that was the food that was available to the colonizer, right? That's the same food that you want because you're not producing enough food for yourself. Now you could go into the, uh, uh, you could try to activate food independence, and that's something that uh, Thomas Sankara and et al. you know had tried, but but that really tells you what neocolonialism is really about. I, I just really wanted to give you that uh, for 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 just those reasons. Now let's see if I could jump to this next part of all of this, and that is going to be. Hold on a second. Go to the PDF. We're going to go to this interesting passage uh, by Fanon. Okay, so Fanon's going to say this because uh, basically you're, you're you're realizing that your culture is your culture is an expression of your economy. Okay, and 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 you know you realize oh neocolonialism is really just us not practicing a good independent economy because again even though all this starvation is going on in africa and all this food hunger you know the heads are not feeling it the himba are not feeling it why because they're not in that economy they're not they're not depending on the west like the rest of us and and again like i said if you're practicing african culture you're like oh man i'm practicing african culture i'm learning a language i'm learning that's not the culture the culture is the economy is that food independence and until you understand that it's it's, it's you know you're playing dress up but, but but let's go on. This is under a colonial regime. No crime is too petty. So he's like, under the colonial regime. Remember, in the, colon, in the colonial regime, what they do is they put you in this urban kind of area. Or they or they, they take you off of the good land and they put you in like, like smaller land and all that kind of stuff. Basically, if you were an agriculturalist or if you were a nomad or whatever, the economy you had, it is, it is cut hard. Okay? So he says, during a colonial regime, no crime is too petty for a loaf of bread. Or a wretched sheep. If you want a sheep or a loaf of bread, no crime is too, too, too petty. Under a colonial regime, man's relationship with the physical world and history is connected to food. In a context of oppression like that of Algeria, remember Algeria are not even black folk; they're they're a bunch of Arabs, right? For the colonized, living does not mean embodying a set of values, does not mean integrating oneself into the coherent, constructed development of the world. To live simply means not to die. To exist means staying alive. Remember. Remember, remember the other brother, uh, the brother, the Hazabe brother. He was like, what's important in life? I mean, what's the most important thing in life? And he basically said to not die. He said, meat. To not die. What, what made him happy? Meat. You know? You know, what's meat? Everything. To exist means staying alive. Every date grown is victory. You know, date. This is, this, these are agriculturalists. Not the result of hard work, but a victory celebrating a triumph over life. Stealing dates, therefore, or allowing one's sheep to eat the neighbor's grass, allowing one's sheep that's herding to, uh, to eat the neighbor's grass is not a disregard for property rights. That's what we talk. We, we in the urban area, we say property rights and, and, and you're breaking the law, right? Or disrespect. That's disrespectful. No, they are attempts at murder. You get it? If I, if I go into the, 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 the hijabe place, and I kill all the animals. I kill all the bad bones. Or I kidnap all the bad bones. They would say that's attempted murder. And they're not just the bad bones because they eat everything, right? So you take all the hyenas, you take all the, you take all the animals out. They'll say you're trying to murder us. You go to the, you go to the, uh, the, 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 the Himba people and you take all their, all their cattle. All their cattle, all their goats, right? They'll fight you. Why? Because, you know, it's not, oh, you're disregarding my property rights. Or you're breaking the law. You're disrespecting me. You're attempting to murder me. Once you've seen men and women in Kabila struggling down into the valley for weeks on end to bring up soil in little baskets, you can understand that theft is attempted murder and not a peccadillo. It's, you know, a small crime. The sole obsession is the need to fill that ever-shrinking stomach, however little in demand. Who do you take it out on, right? So this is really important. The French are down on the plane with the police, the army, and their tanks. In the mountains, there are only Algerians. Up above, heaven with his promise of afterlife. Do down below, the French with their firm promises of jails, beatings, and executions. Inevitably, you stumble up against yourself. Here lies the core of self-hatred that characterizes race conflict in segregated societies. Look at this. He's talking about race. He's talking about self-hatred. In, among Arabs based off of a depressed economy. 
See, we like to talk about economics, I and mean, we like to talk about psychology, and we don't really pay attention to ecology. And this is why, you know, it's going to be hard for us to progress as a people. It's going to be hard for us to progress as a people until we get onto this economics, ecology conversation. And not the economics that says, hey, you know what, let's try to build wealth in the Western fashion. Because the reality is this, that if, as long as you have USD, you will have to feed into the Western economy, right? Uh, you have to think about how you can eat, how you can feed your own people, and how you can do that in an advanced economic way. That is what I am telling you. Again, you, 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 you know... That's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, go get yourself, uh, uh, you know, a copy of, of, of the literature because this is really, really, very important. We're going to jump into this example of, 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 of gangs, you know, because, you know, we talk about self-hatred. Okay. We talk about self-hatred, but let me tell you this. If I, like, I, I, I would do events in the hood, okay? When I did events in the hood, I had to pull up flyers, right? And I'm walking through the hood and I'm pulling up flyers and there are kids watching me. Kids watching me and talking on their phone and, and all that kind of stuff. And they're like reporting my movements. And I'm like, what are they doing? He's like, they're, you know, and, and you know, I'm, with a, I'm with a friend and he's saying, oh yeah, they're, uh, they're lookouts. They're, 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 they're paying attention to what's going on. And so it's like, what is going on, right? Now, here's this. I'm, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you another way to tell you this. If I go into the hood and I said, look, I'm going to stay on this corner and sell drugs, right? To the same customers that these, the resident uh, gangsters are selling drugs to, right? They'll probably try to kill me, right? So, so when I was, you know, in the hood, I'm on the corner and I'm, you know, handing out pamphlets. They're coming to me and asking me, like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm teaching this uh, tutoring class. I'm like, oh, okay. Math tutoring? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm like, okay, cool. Right? And they walk away. I'm like, are you interested? No, I'm not interested in that. I just wanted to know if you were selling drugs in my neighborhood. They didn't say that, but, you know, that's what it is. So, so you, on the other hand, you know, because you're in the psychology school, or, you know, before the ecology school, you're saying, man, these black folk have self-hatred. These black folk have self-hatred because... You know, they, they, you know, why can't you just all get along? Why are you killing people? This person standing on the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you should learn to work together and build an economy and blah, 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 blah. No. If, again, an economy is how you survive and thrive. When you're in that kind of environment, uh, selling drugs is a way to survive or thrive. Right? Because... If you're not good at mathematics, if you're not good at reading, and not to say that these people aren't good at math and reading, but I'm just saying that as an individual, if you don't see school as a, a real opportunity for you to survive or thrive off of, right, then you're going to try other things, whether that be basketball, whether that be so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. And that's where that self-hate comes in. And that's, and, and, and sorry, that's why you would say self-hate and you would say this is a psychological problem to address. But the real thing you have to address is how can you keep these people eating? And if you don't address that point of how do you feed these people, because the reality is this, that you're not feeding these people. If you don't get how to feed and clothe and shelter these people, then you are not doing anything for them. Again, economy, ecology is one of the most important things for us to understand if we're going to move forward as a people. The other example I want to give you is this conscious example, right? You have to notice this, that Yvette Carnell and Tariq she never had any beef. They never had any beef until they went for the same customers, right? So Yvette Carnell does this thing. She, she, she releases this. Basically, every once in a while, no, every people have this sort of jingoism, uh, especially when they, if, if, you, if you tickle their economy bone, right? Black folk feeling the, the pinch of not being able to survive and thrive. And worse, uh, seeing other people survive and thrive in the country that they've been resident to for hundreds of years, right? They feel a type of way about it. They say, hey, you know what? That's like, how can I articulate how I don't like this, right? So Yvette Carnell, QB Yvette Carnell, she comes in and she says, yeah, you know what? We should have. Well, you know, one of the things that we should have is reparations. And another thing we should have, like, reparations will make us survive and thrive. Or even 
you know, the economic the economic situation is so bad that it doesn't look like we're going to survive and thrive for long unless something happens and and we have to distinct ourselves from other people and blah, blah 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 blah. And she does that, and then she gets some she gets some play. You know, she's talking economy, she's talking economics. She gets some play, right? So Tariq, you know, the uh, the hustler, right? And they're all hustlers. Everybody's a hustler. Tariq's a hustler. You know, they're both con people at all, right? But you realize he's like, hey, let me get into that action, right? And if that's like, yeah, sure, but, you know, shh, keep your distance, you know, I'm going to be the main collector, right? You know, if I do an ADOS event, it's going to be my ADOS event, right? And I'm going to get the I'm gonna get the thing. And, and Drake's like, no, 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 look, look. Maybe we could both have. So it's, and he's, so he's like, no, if, if ADOS is my thing. I trademarked it. And so Tariq says, okay, well, then I'm going to do my own thing, FBA. Same customers. And then they start beefing with each other. Why? Because of economics. It's the same as if I go into the hood, I'm selling drugs on the corner, you know, for cheaper, you know. Like, like, like whoa, you can't do that. You're, you're, you're threatening my livelihood. You know, if you, if you got to pay attention to Vance Carnell's videos, you know, you can see in the super chat. Like, you see my super chat, you don't see any donations. You know, it is what it is, right? Uh, I, don't think, I don't think I have enough followers to get any donations. So if you want, if you want to donate, uh, get my followership up. You know, get my followers up. Or you can also hit up my cash app. It's in the description. You know, and I'd appreciate it. You would appreciate it too, right? Uh, notwithstanding that, uh, that's, you know, they never had no beef. Right, but you look at her cash app. Sorry, you look at her uh, her super chat. Big donate, like that big note. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's big money, but five hundred dollars, hundred dollars, two hundred dollars. You know, coming to this lady for talking nonsense. Right, it's 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 a, it's a good gig for her. Tariq Nasheed sees that and he says, "Whoa, let me get some. Let me get on that. That's those are my customers." Same thing happened with uh, uh, Umar Johnson and Tariq, or Umar Johnson and this guy. You know. Uh, you know, I don't want to say his name, to be honest. You know, but like a lot of them, yeah, you know, he's like a relationship guru or something. Well, not a guru, but a relationship talker. You know, he's just nonsense. But the point is that all these hustlers, they're like, hey, look, I got some customers, blah blah blah. They have beef with each other around economic issues, around you went into my hood and sold drugs on my corner, right? And so. You don't look at self-hate as a psychology thing. You don't say, oh, well, I hope these black... Like, if you say, hey, black folks should have on culture. You know, we should be on culture. We should be on code and all that kind of stuff. You're being ridiculous. Again, it's not psychology. It's ecology. You know? There's a quote I studied a long time ago, which was, judge by cause, not by effect. That's what we have to do. And I want to actually give you this. So this is another page in the Book of Power, right? This is another page of the Book of Power. We're going to switch over to it uh, very quickly. Um, this is actually the, I don't think it's in the main book. Um, I don't think it's in the preview. I think it's in the book itself. And this is actually one of the most important uh, quotes in human history or in African history, right? Uh, this is the letter to Marikare. And uh, it's a good translation of it. So this is uh, Keti Asaba, Instructions to Marikare. This is... Oh, okay, so there's a translation in the Probat Compendium too, right? But here's what the the uh, the ancestor says, right? And by the way, when I say ancestor, I want you to realize that, you know, when we talk about, oh yeah, we're descended from the ancient Egyptians, right? Um, or whatever, right? Or, or we're partly descended, or, we're, or they're the same people of us. You know, it sounds just like, to other people, it sounds just like the Himba or the Hezabe saying that. You know what I mean? Like, like, again, you have to, except for the, this, I want to tell you, the Himba and the Hezabe have independent economies, but you don't. So, so you really have to seriously, seriously say to yourself, look, how can I get an independent economy? Okay? How can I get an independent economy? And, and of course, you know, your start would be, you know, this book I'm showing you. But notwithstanding that, I really, I really do encourage you to get an independent economy because just saying, hey, it's my ancestor, blah, 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 that sounds good. But you have to be able to provide for yourself. Otherwise, you are a dependent, and it's not that impressive, right? So again, this is what the ancestor said. To lo, the miserable Eurasian, he is a wretched because of the place he's in, short of water, bare of wood. Its paths are many and painful because of mountains. He does not dwell in one place. He's a nomad. Food propels his legs. Food, he fights since the time of Heru, not conquering nor being conquered, so on and so forth. Um, 
The Eurasian is a crocodile on its shore. It snatches from a lonely road. It cannot siege from populace. Now, of course, this all changed when he got industrialized. But you notice that they're saying the Eurasian is shaped by his ecology. He is wretched because of the place he's in, which is short of water, bare of wood. For what it's worth, when you go back to Job, Job is talking about, you know, the note, like, you know, he's like, oh, he's sedentary. But he says, you know, that we have abundance of food. And he's right. There was, when you look at the Hizabe people, there was an abundance of food. Of course, they go hungry when they don't hunt successfully, but there was an abundance of meat around them. There were lions, antelopes, zebras, so on and so forth. He had more as a hunter-gatherer in Africa than the hunter-gatherers in Europe, right? They have more, you know, the Himba people have a whole bunch of sheep, a whole bunch of grazing land uh, as compared to the grazing land of the Eurasian. Now, now of course, the question becomes, uh, you know, Job, Job was saying he wasn't sure if it was biological or ecological, uh, whether uh, Wazungu is that bitter and xenophobic and all that kind of stuff. And of course, I would just say it's both, obviously. You know, everything is biological and everything is ecological, you know? There's, there's no such thing as being just one or the other. Uh, notwithstanding that, you know, this was, I thought this was a very interesting passage and you know, I do, I do want to, uh, I do have a little bit more to say. And I thank you, everybody, for being patient with me. Uh, you know, I think this was a really interesting conversation to have. And I'm glad that I could share it with you on this day. But, of course, don't forget to check out the other programs on KWZ Radio. This is D-Web with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, everyone. This is Koku from the Bitter Medicine Podcast, inviting you to tune in to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Pro-Black Perspective on KWAZ Radio. Okay, so let's go back into this literature. Um, what can I tell you else? Uh, so this is it. Africa, uh, here's, what, here's what I want really, really want you to get. When you understand this economy thing, right, you realize that we are being programmed by this Westerner and one of the things that we're programmed to say is that Africa is rich. Okay? Africa is not rich. Africa is not rich. Okay? Um, the thing is that Africa has resources that are valued to the extent that you can exchange those resources for Western currencies. You know? And those Western currencies give you access to Western goods and services. Okay? The Hizabe and the Himba aren't rich and they're not even do any money or compensation if their land is taken from them and neither are you you know neither are you you see wazungu when, when wazungu shows up and he shows up to cities now here's the thing you gotta realize too when you're in an industrial economy right even the agricultural economy is not that impressive see cause i want to say this right um you know i was talking to uh, you know like i said a westerner Right? You know, they're, they're African, but, but they're, they're Western. And they're, they weren't impressed with the Hezabe. They were not impressed with the Himba. Like I told you, that they were saying about the Himba, uh, you know, why don't they go out and get some seasoning? You know? Like, they were not impressed with the, uh, the Himba. All right? Uh, the idea... Now, 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 we have these nice kingdoms and, and, and civilizations... Uh, you know, from Egypt and, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, what's this called? Uh, uh, oh, the Yoruba, the Akan, the, uh, you know, so on and so forth, right? Uh, Menimotapa, Menimotapa, so on and so forth, right? We have all this, that, if you're an urban, industrial Wazungu, you're not that impressed. You're, and, and here's the thing too, it's like, oh, you displace people from their land, you give them money, why are you giving them money? Their economy is not even monetary. Like their economy doesn't even suit your Western economy. You giving them money is just you inviting them into your country. You understand? 
like us asking for money or reparations or anything is really just us saying, I want to be a part of your economic order. Right. And so you see, this is actually a pretty interesting video. Like I said, I got this huge luck. I'm recording this on September 3rd. This was released just a few hours before I started recording. Right. This is that brother. Good person. Uh, I don't know if I can say this. Umzilikazi wa Africa. Right. A musician. Uh, check out their platform, check out their music, it's pretty good music, right? But I just saw this and I was like, yup, gotta, 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 gotta put it in, right? He says, despite its popularity as a tourist destination, the area has no visitor center or gate fees and local residents receive little income from tourism. Hashtags like uh, Africa. And then it's a nice little video. Seconds, 14 seconds, right? So... So basically, it's just a beautiful scenery, right? And Westerners value the scenery. And so they come and they take pictures and they look around and so on and so forth. And us with our, 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 our understanding of e economics, right, or our misunderstanding of economics, we come up with this sort of idea, which is, uh, well, you sh we should have money from your tourism. You understand? I hope you're getting what I'm saying now. Like, by now, you understand why we went through all of that. By now, you're understanding why we went through all that. Because what, what, what you have is that that is not a way to survive or thrive. That is not a way for an individual to survive or thrive. And essentially, what... What Wazungu did was Wazungu said, hey, look, I'm surviving and thriving in my own economy. And now I can go out into other parts of the world and enjoy the planet. Right. They don't need to pay you for that. You, you know, I mean, I mean, it's it's. It's fundamental. We really get this because. We're not setting up an economy for ourselves. And there's this idea that, hey, people should pay us you know, for tourism or something, right? Really misunderstands what, like essentially we're willing to sell Africa. We're still willing to sell Africa. When we say Africa is rich, that means that we're willing to give it to Wazungu. Because the reality is this, that, that gold isn't worth more than mag, like, like isn't worth anything. It's not worth anything. What, 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 it, what happens is that Wazungu likes it. And because Wazungu wants it and likes it, that's why it's worth something. But that just means that you're willing to sell Africa. I want to tell you this. So, like I told you guys about checking out KWZ Radio. You know, Bitter Medicine had this good, um, had this good paper. And at one point, he, he talks about this incident that I wasn't even familiar with, right? And that was, he says, uh, when a white man saw black folk in West Africa, were exchanging cowrie shells as currency, right? So the cowrie shell was in a how you access the markets and how you got goods and services in Western Africa, right? What he did was he, the white man, went to East Africa where they didn't care about the shells and returned to West Africa rich. You understand? Cowrie shells don't have any value intrinsically. Gold doesn't have any value intrinsically. Magma doesn't have any value. Rice doesn't have any value intrinsically. What happens is that if somebody else desires something, you would give, you know, you give it to them. So when you say Africa's rich, you're saying, hey, you know what? We have a lot of things that you desire. It doesn't have any, like, Coltan doesn't have any real value. You know? Cobalt doesn't have any real value, but Wazungu wants it for industrialization to say, oh, yeah, Wazungu should now pay me. It's just you trying to become a part of the Western economy. That's all. Now, what you have to really try to do is become a part of your own African economy. This is something that you're not hearing elsewhere because everybody else is telling you Africa's rich. Right? You understand? But, but that'd be like what's going over to East saying, oh, East Africa's rich because they got a bunch of calorie shells on the floor. No. You know, that no. And see, now, now I want to do this though right here because that's, that's really important. You know? Because 
what the white man did when he went to East Africa, got a bunch of cowrie shells, you know, because there's nothing, got a bunch of cowrie shells and, and put it in West Africa, he was able to get, like, take advantage of, of African people in West Africa. Right? And so to protect himself from that, you know, like like the paper. You know, like like, like you would say, hey, man, you know, the, the paper, the, you know, the paper money is not worth anything. It's just paper. It's just, you know, a tree colored in, you know, with, with, with coloring. Right? That's the point. Because they don't want that same thing happening. You know, if the currency were lava, were magma, right? Then the people living near volcanoes would be healthy. Well, wealthy. You know, that could have been a nice sound bite, right? <laughs> Let me say it again, right? If the currency were magma, people near volcanoes would be wealthy. But you don't want that to be the case. If you're, if, you're, if you're trying to have a functioning economy, you don't want people going to the other side of the world, finding your currency in abundance, and then bringing it back to your market and taking advantage, taking your food from you. You know, you know uh, what is it called? Destabilizing your economy because you decided to find value in something that you could find on the floor. You know? That's the reason why the paper, that's the reason why the coin was was to avoid that. You know? Uh, you know, imagine the 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 the, the quote unquote uh kings of uh well, I shouldn't say kings, but the the the, the, the actually, whatever. The the leaders of, of Europe, you know, they're like, Oh yeah, gold is really valuable, you know, you gotta have gold, gold, gold. And then you go to Africa and the gold's coming out of the ground. They're like, Oh yeah, we can't do the gold anymore. That's not that's not that valuable. You know? Gold isn't worth more than magma in reality. Let me tell you this. Gold is not worth more than magma or a grain of rice. It is prettier. That's all. And some people want it. That's it. It's just prettier and some people want it. But if nobody wanted gold, then it's not, it's not worth anything. Just like when nobody wanted coltan, it wasn't worth anything. It, 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 the, if the, the Hezabes could see something on the ground, like the Hezabe could pass by gold. They don't care. They want meat. The, 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 the Himba could pass by gold. They don't care. They want meat. The, 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 the Yoruba could pass by gold and they might, they might care. They might care. And, and they might care because somebody, uh, like some Arab somewhere, probably says, you know what? I would like some gold. I'll give you something for gold. I'll give you some of this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these spices for gold. That's what the world of trade is. And so, again, if you say Africa is rich, yeah, you're talking about that. So, again, I, I, want, I want to just reiterate what I said about Western colonialism and the capitalist economy. The, for the white man, colonialism is survived by working and thrive by exchanging resources for currency, which is access to Western goods and services. And for the capitalist to thrive, thriving, uh, thrives by, you know, he survives by the same thing, working. You know, if you're in a capitalist economy, you survive by working. And you thrive by transforming raw materials into finished goods. And selling them for currency. That's it. Access to Western goods and, so, and services. So even now, when we seek to bring more dollars, which have value only to Westerners. Remember, these dollars are just paper, just paper that has value to Westerners. You know, you know, your ability to access Western markets, right? When we decide, hey, you know, we're going to build wealth in the West and we're going to bring these dollars back to Africa. Even that, the so-called African nationals are intent on selling Africa. You understand? Know even, 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 even we're like, yeah, let's go sell Africa. We want to bring dollars. We're going to bring dollars. We're going to bring value. We're going to sell Africa, right? We're intent on a dependent economy. A lot of us are depend on, not, not me, but a lot of people are intent on a dependent economy. And then we wonder why Africans there already sell out when Western currency is only good for Western goods and services. Now, of course, listen to this. We do, you know, you know, one of the things that African people, you know, African nationalists, like, for instance, you know, let's, let's go to Nyerere, right? Nyerere was a socialist and a yada yada. He was like, yeah, I'm going to go in debt to uh, the, the World Bank or whatever so that we can get, you know, money. And that's money can be used to get industrial uh, equipment, you know, industrial equipment. Basically, in order to... Uh, like I said, you have this urban problem where you can't feed people. In order to feed these people, you have to, uh, you have to go. You know, you have to farm on the land, right? But the reality is that you know, uh, 
you can do industrial farming and industrial farming will be that much more efficient. You would need that fewer people for the mass amount of land. Remember, remember, in fact, the uh, plantation system, right? The plantation system was such that you had a whole bunch of enslaved individuals to labor on this land and it was laborious, right? Now, when you come along with uh, industrial equipment, you don't need that many people anymore, right? And then those people can be freed up to do other things and so on and so forth, right? That, uh, that's very important, you know? Now, that's to say that, yeah, you would, uh, you could still have dollars or you could still bring in dollars uh, to buy industrial equipment, but understand that in order to get these industrial equipment, in order to get these, uh, these, 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 this debt, in a sense, you had to sell your resources. You had to exchange your resources. So I want one thing from you, which is do not use the word world economy anymore. Don't use the word world economy anymore or global economy. Don't, don't use it. Just call it what it is. It's the European economy. These economies are just European economies. And, and, and people in the West, they're just a part of the European economy. And, and you have to be very careful to what extent you are perverting the economies of Africa with the European economy, okay? You, you notice that the Himba people and the Hedzabe people did eat European food. They did try it, at least. They said, oh, yeah, we don't like the taste, right? Or, you know, it's different and blah, blah, blah. They did it, though, right? But they did not get sucked into it. They're not become dependent on it. Look here. You got an industrial machine. You got a nice tractor. That tractor breaks down. How do you repair it? Now, of course, that's the challenge for African people. So we're going to go into we're, we're, we're closing out soon. Right. The challenge of African nationalism is to create an African economy. OK, that is a means for which Africans can survive and thrive then they can build a political structure around that and a culture around that. That's how you do things. See, a lot of times you talk about, oh, yeah, we got to have this culture. You know, oh, yeah, let's, let's learn this language. What do you learn this language for? What, 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 you know, why are you learning a trade language? Oh, we just learning a trade language, you know, just, just, for, just, for, just for giggles. You know, we learn a trade language just for giggles. You ain't trading nothing. You know? If you're really serious about pan-African nationalism, you have to be serious about an African economy. Okay, that's it. Right now, that means how to survive and thrive without Wazungu. Okay, and that, look, and the trouble is this: that's not even a concept among African people. See, see, that's that's why I don't even mess with the socialists. That's why I don't mess with the socialists because. You realize that socialism is an economy. It's like a political economy. It's, it's, it's almost capturing the reality that you have to change the political economy. But it's not a realistic political economy. It's the same capitalism, just with a different upper management. But the same capitalism is based around extracting resources and transforming them into finished products for a profit or what have you. Right. And they might say, well, there's no profit. We're just transforming it and sharing it among each other. That's stupid. It's not realistic. If you I mean, I, I didn't have it queued up, but Carter G. Woodson uh, talks about this in his book. Uh, uh, in his book, let me see if uh, let me see if I can actually pull up that quote. Uh, give me two seconds. But yeah, Carter G. Woodson talks about that in his book. He says, look, if you're talking about uh, socialism at this point, like, like you're crazy, you're crazy, and 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 this is this is actually pretty important. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up right right quick. Um, so if you guys don't know, there's this website called History as a Weapon, and you could find Miseducation of the Negro there. I'm just gonna try to find the text quickly. Uh, let me see something. Um. Give me two seconds, all right? I, I wish I, like, I didn't think about it. So let's see. Let's go to this. So the, pro the trouble is that he doesn't use the word socialism, per se. Um, oh, yeah, the word, I think, is competition. So you can see, I looked up socialism. I found this section. Um, let's see. 
Okay. And he talks about the uneducated, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this might be the section, but I would have to... Let me just look up the word competition, okay? Because I remember him saying competition. Uh, competition is keener. Competition of the Negro. Under the present regime of competition. Uh, overthrow it. Improve his condition. Do the so-called impossible. Um, hold on a second. Competition, trifle. Competition with the modern factory. Uh, unprofitable competition. There's no handicap. Okay, yeah, yeah. So he says, in suggesting, so there was actually a lot there. You saw that. There was a lot of talk about capitalism versus uh, communism in Russia and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson was living through this period, and, and so it's worthwhile to, it's, it's really worthwhile to reread his book, particularly if you're from America, right? Or not from America, but if you identify with being f from America, right? Uh, so anyways, in suggesting herein the rise of the new Negro in politics, the author does not have in mind the so-called radical Negro who have read and misunderstood Karl Marx and his disciples and would solve the political as well as the economic problems of the race by an immediate application of these principles. History shows that although large numbers of people have actually tried to realize such pleasant dreams, they have the, the final analysis come back to a social program based on competition. If no one is to enjoy the fruits of his exceptional labor, thriving, any more than the individual who is not prepared to render such extraordinary services, right, so the guy who's just surviving, right, not one of a thousand will be sufficiently humanitarian to bestir himself to achieve much of importance and force applied in the case to stimulate such action has always broken down. So he's like, yeah, you know, like let's say you're uh, among the uh, Hezabe, right? You're, you're building things that all, like benefits everybody, but like, like you know, why is, what's the point of building it, right? Um, not to say that they wouldn't, but just to say that, you know, particularly in this economy, it's just not even the same. Like what kind of human labor you're going to be using uh, and not being rewarded for it, right? So he says, if the excited whites who are bringing to the Negroes such strange doctrines are sane enough to believe them, the Negroes themselves should learn to think before it is too late. I shouldn't really use the word Negro, but you get it. Uh, that just means people of the Niger, by the way, right? But anyway, um, you know, it basically just means West Africans, right? Uh, insane enough to believe them, the Negroes themselves should learn to think before it's too late. So what, 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 this is just an interesting side note or an interesting sidebar is this idea, this notion that, you know, even Carter G. Woodson said, you know, a lot of people try the socialism stuff. It just doesn't work. It's not realistic. You know, it's not realistic. Um, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, but, but again, I, I brought it up to say, you have to try to survive and thrive without Wazungu. And that means without Wazungu in your head, too. Without forming an economy that doesn't really function outside of sending resources back to Europe for finished goods and completing goods. Now, of course, you do want to industrialize on your own and you do want to uh, form something along, uh, you know, similar lines. And that's why, you know, of course, you can't see the text, but I said this is the biggest threat uh, no, actually, I'm supposed to show you this image. Um, give me two seconds. So, this right here, let's see if you can see it clearly. Oh, no, you can't. Uh, this right here is is one of the most important images you will see uh, out of America, okay? Um, but let's just go on. I said, again, you know, you have to survive and thrive without Wazungu. And that, so far, it's not even a concept among African people. You saw the gentleman earlier talking about, hey, let's go be truckers and, and HVACs and, uh, you know, electricians. That's going to get us some good pay, right? That's how you are thinking. That's how you are brought up and developed to think. How can I survive with Wazungu? How can I thrive with Wazungu? Even when you go to Africa, you're like, hey, you know, it'd be better if, you know, we can get white people to buy pineapples at a better rate. You know, they can buy the ground nuts at a better rate. How can we trade and get a better advantage? 
you know that you know how can we trade and get more, better profit for us that again is not surviving and thriving without wasm okay it's not now can we trade among ourselves that's the question right but you know i want you to understand that economy and economics is the most important question for you and this is why the biggest threat to america wasn't black people it wasn't natives it wasn't radical whites but the buffalo okay so what you see in front of you if you if you're not just listening if you actually can see the visual is a bunch of buffalo skulls these are the bison that the white Americans slaughtered because they understood that if they didn't kill these buffalo, if they didn't pollute the waters, if they didn't uh, remove people from the land or whatever, then people would live, or they didn't cut down the forest, people would live in another economy. It's the economy that truly, like economic independence is the biggest threat you can have for other, uh, for capitalists in a sense, or for white people, right? That's the biggest threat you can have, economic independence, and not economic development. That's what socialism is allegedly. Not economic development, economic independence. If most of us were Hezabe, then there would be, yeah, they would, they would want to clash with us. Now, here's the, that's the other issue, right? We have to accomplish independent or interdependent food first and foremost and because the biggest threat to america was the buffalo right uh so i tell you this all right so so actually that was i thought that was the end but it wasn't the end so i, I kind of said it like the end this is the end right i've told you the first step to liberation is land okay the Hezabe and himba are free africans the yoruba were free africans the kemichu free the zulu free the only question now is how do we invent a freedom for more Africans and a freedom that enjoys the resources and resourcefulness that we can accomplish as Africans who want to not only defend themselves against foreigners, but propel ourselves into the future. See, the thing with the Hezabe and the Himba, they can't defend themselves against foreigners. Even the Yoruba couldn't defend themselves. And the Yoruba could, could, could have defeated the Hezabe and the Himba. You know, and I just use Yoruba because I'm just saying an agriculturist. The agricultural economy cannot defend itself against the industrial economy. So you either have to have your own industrial economy or something much better. But again, you have to focus on food first and foremost. Okay, you have to focus on food first and foremost. Because if your food is only coming from the West, you're never going to beat them. And that's just a basic rule of warfare. You're never going to beat someone who feeds you. Because they could just stop feeding you. Right? So, the goal is what? An advanced, independent economy. And guess where? Guess what? You're just in luck. You can read more about creating an advanced, independent economy in the Book of Power. All right? So, now you know what I'm working on. And you have the book to work on it, too. So, without further ado, I want you to hit that like button. Give me some more subscribes. Share the knowledge with your loved ones. And of course, join the Discord, you know, and hit me up about what you're loving from my books. As well, I want you to also check out and join the KWAZ network. It's it's it will be it'll be great. And of course, contact me if you're interested. But other than that, I'm grateful for your time. I know this was a longer one, but I'm grateful for your time. I hope this was advantageous to you i enjoyed it i hope you enjoyed it as well and until next time shamiam hotep uncle jason neb neb amen ma'at dua nature